My dear friends, it is indeed a very great pleasure and privilege for me to be back here in Dayton for your family conference. Uh, this evening earlier, uh, I found it hard to believe that seven years had passed uh, since I last had the privilege uh, of being with you. But when I was standing beside Pastor Fortner a moment ago singing, I realized that I couldn't read the words of uh, these songs without my glasses. I didn't have that problem seven years ago. Uh, so the passage of time uh, is taking its, its toll. I, I've always said that I never enjoyed a conference more uh, than the last time I was with you. And I'm enormously grateful uh, for the invitation uh, to return. Uh, my pleasure at being with you and at the prospect of renewing old friendships and making new ones has been heightened uh, by the presence of my wife with me, whom I hope many of you will have an opportunity of meeting. Uh, she has kindly been invited uh, by our hosts. Uh, and another great plus of the visit was the opportunity to spend the weekend in Mebane and to develop fellowship with the people of God in that place. I look forward to the whole of the conference. I look forward with enormous pleasure to the prospect of ministry from Pastors Hendricks and Pizzino each morning and to fellowship with you all. Uh, the subject allotted to me for this conference was uh, the doctrine of hell. And I plan to approach that subject on the four evenings uh, topically or thematically. I trust our studies will be exegetical, but we shall not be focusing in on a particular passage each evening. Rather, I want to approach the subject by means of four questions. And the first one this evening is, why should we think about hell? Why should we think about hell? It is uh, an extremely unpleasant subject. One writer has described it as the ultimate horror of God's universe. And you, of course, are here for a, fa for a holiday conference. You're here to relax, to be refreshed, to enjoy yourself. A few weeks ago, a friend was asking me, well, perhaps he wasn't just as close a friend as I imagined, but he was asking me uh, where I was going and who I was speaking for, and, and he said, what is your topic? And I said, I've been asked to, to speak four times uh, on the doctrine of hell. And he said, isn't that absolutely typical of Reformed Baptists? <laughs> when they meet together for a relaxing, enjoyable holiday, what subject do they choose to consider together but the topic of hell? What a morbid people they must be. Why should we think about hell? And perhaps we are put off the subject further by the way throughout history that Christians zealously but unwisely have caricatured and distorted and misrepresented the biblical doctrine. Let me give you some quotations. One preacher speaks of the wicked hanging by their tongues from hooks while the flaming fire torments them from beneath. Another says of a, someone in hell, the flames of fire gushed from his ears and eyes and nostrils, and out of every pore. Another describes the damned eating each other, tearing each other with their teeth. One preacher, and I quote, sounds almost gloating or joyful about hell. He says, the little child is in this red hot oven. It beats its little head against the roof of the oven and stamps its little feet on the floor. 
Hear how it screams to come out. See how it turns and twists itself in the fire. Now much of those statements go far beyond the sober, measured, restrained statements of Scripture. They owe more to a vivid imagination than to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. They are crude. They are inaccurate. They are unbiblical. And they have brought the whole subject into disrepute. And we have a reluctance to to be classed with that sort of representation of the doctrine of hell. And then there's a personal reluctance in dealing with the doctrine. A friend who I esteem highly warned me before I began to study. And he said, this study will cost you. It will mark you. It will be a burden upon you. And I have to say that it has. And at times I've sometimes thought of my friends in Lebanon and said to myself, why did they assign me such a topic? There are so many truths in Scripture which thrill us and excite us. And as we think about them, we're filled with joy and gladness. And we're moved to worship and gratitude over these glorious truths. It is a joy to study them and to prepare them. It is a foretaste of heaven. But to sit and to ponder on the fate of the damned brings a heaviness on the spirit. And in my human weakness, I want to be liked. I want to be popular. I want you to to think of me with gratitude as a friend. And there is that in my flesh that was saying, but these people will not remember my messages with anything but a sense of, of dread. How I wish I could speak on something else. Such a somber and terrible theme. And so I've asked myself this question, why should we think about hell? And we all need to ask it. If we're going to spend four evenings studying it, we need to be convinced, convinced in our hearts and souls that it is mandatory that we should study it. That it is of the utmost importance for our souls and the souls of a generation to come. That this is a key doctrine which we cannot and dare not neglect. And only if we do so will we come with appropriate seriousness and expectation. Why should we think about hell? I want to suggest three reasons this evening. We should think about hell in the first place because of its intrinsic importance. Its intrinsic importance. Now, of course, everything in the Bible is important. But it is nonetheless true that there are some truths which have proportionately a greater and more vital importance than others. If we are ignorant of the fine points of the doctrine of angels, or of some of the details of the Old Testament food laws, we will be the poor. That is to be regretted, but we will not be damned. We will not be lost. We will survive. Other doctrines, however, are indispensable. In his great book, The Reformed Pastor, Richard Baxter urges pastors to preach on these doctrines more than others. He says, other things may be known, but these must be known, or else men are undone forever. And hell is such a doctrine. It must be known. Let me adduce four lines of evidence to emphasize its intrinsic importance. The first 
is the massive weight of biblical testimony. The massive weight of biblical testimony. Hell is not something that is referred to occasionally, now and then, here and there, in one or two obscure, disputed passages of Scripture. No. Huge sections of the Word of God bear on this doctrine. There are more references in the Bible to the wrath of God than to the love of God. The Old Testament is full in every book of our Lord's fierce judgment on his enemies, foreshadowings of hell. Our Lord Jesus Christ had far more to say about hell than he did about heaven. That surprises some people. But it's true. One scholar says that there are approximately 1,870 verses in the New Testament which record words of Christ. 13% of these deal with judgment and hell. For an eighth of what he says, he speaks of judgment and hell more than any other topic. The key word for hell in the New Testament is Gehenna. And on every single occasion except one, that word is spoken by Jesus. The one exception is James chapter 3 verse 6 with reference to the tongue. We call him the Savior. And even that very blessed name draws attention to the dreadful fate from which he saves us. There is a massive weight of biblical testimony. Now, my friends, if God has chosen in his wisdom to provide us in his holy word with so much information about hell, is it not patently obvious that it is something which is hugely important? And that alone would be reason enough for studying it. We cannot neglect it if the Holy Spirit has given us such a weight of information about it. But then secondly, it's intrinsically important, not only because of the proportion of Scripture given to the doctrine, but to the actual content of the doctrine itself. It tells us of a place of torment where millions of human beings will be enclosed forever. I'm told that 95 million human beings die every year. I haven't checked the math of this, so please don't correct me, but I think it's approximately right. That means that every second Three human beings are entering hell or heaven. By the time I have finished this address, 11,000 of our fellow human beings will have gone forever to a place of everlasting joy or a place of everlasting torment. And as you sit here, Imagine them dying, even now, as I speak. One, and another, and another, and another, and every time my hand falls, another human being, think of it, another human being is entering heaven or hell forever. If there had been a plane crash this morning, if two or three hundred people had suddenly been snatched into eternity. We'd all be talking about it this evening. We'd be grief-stricken. Our minds would be full of it. We could think of nothing else. And yet 11,000 of our fellow human beings, every hour of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, are entering their eternal 
destination. Surely this is a reason why such a doctrine is intrinsically important. And thirdly, it's important because we are not remote from this catastrophe. I remember the phrase of Sam Waldron and something he wrote where he said, Death is not a spectator sport. When we're at a spectator sport, we're not involved. We don't feel involved. We're indifferent. It doesn't touch us. I'm looking forward with immense interest and eagerness to the volleyball match on Wednesday evening between the elders and the deacons. And I will be able to see just how sanctified some of my fellow elders are. And I do so with a greater pleasure because I know that nothing on earth would persuade me to stand on that volleyball court and participate. I will be a spectator. I am not involved. I, I say that officially now. <laughs> we feel uninvolved. It doesn't really matter what happens. It doesn't concern us. But friends, that is not true of this doctrine. For every one of us in this room, by nature, is headed to that very place. It is not something that doesn't concern us. We have all sinned. And we fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And it is appointed for men to die once and after death, the judgment. Every one of us is intimately involved. Some of you may think that there are some Bible doctrines that don't involve you. You would be unwise to think that, but you may think that none of, nonetheless. Some of you who are not parents may feel that the biblical instruction to parents is of no immediate concern to you. Some of you who are not employers may skip lightly over the teaching of the word of God to employers or to the rich or to so on. Now that would be a mistake on your part, but it would be understandable. You would say, well, it's interesting, it's true, but it doesn't immediately concern me. But none of us, none of us can ever dare to say that of the doctrine of hell. It is the certain destiny of every unsaved sinner. And we are born sinners. And then fourthly and lastly, it is intrinsically important, not only because of the massive weight of biblical testimony, the content of the doctrine, the way in which we are involved in it, but because there is only one way of escape from hell. It is not the case that there is a whole range of options open to us, various possibilities to lessen our anxiety, all sorts of categories of people who won't go there. We can't say to ourselves, well, hell is dreadful, Hell is a reality, but after all, there are many, many ways of avoiding hell. So I don't need to be unduly concerned. The scripture is clear. Only one way, through faith in Jesus Christ. He who does not believe the Son, says the Savior, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Everyone else is damned. If you do not believe on Christ as your Savior, you are damned. You are headed straight for hell. Why should we think about hell? Because we're going there unless we find the one way of escape. So here is our answer to those who would speak of those morbid people who at a holiday conference think about hell. And I would say to them, would you bring that same charge against a conference of physicians? 
who met to discuss cancer? Would you say what a morbid group? What an unhealthy type of men they must be. They meet together and all they can discuss is, is the sickness. We wouldn't say that, would we? We would be thankful that there were men who were studying it. We would be grateful that there were people who were giving their skill and their insight and their knowledge to dealing with this dreadful reality that they might help us, that they might bring us healing, that they might be a blessing to us. We would thank God for those people who were studying that disease. We would pray that they would be helped and blessed. And we would say they're not studying cancer because they like to, but because it is a reality. Thank God for men and women who are honest enough to face reality. But hell is a reality, a dreadful reality. And the most positive, the most loving, the most responsible thing that we can do is to study that doctrine that we may be used to deliver men and women from that dreadful place. That is our reason and our purpose. It's intrinsic importance. Why should we think about hell? The second reason. Because of the pervasiveness of unbelief about hell. Because of the pervasiveness of unbelief. If hell was something which was universally accepted, which all people believed and agreed on, something on which everyone was accurately informed, if everyone knew about hell and believed in hell, then we mightn't need to spend so much time studying it together. But the truth of the matter is that in our generation, belief in hell has declined almost to the point of disappearance. Let me just very briefly illustrate that on three levels. Three levels of unbelief. There's first of all what we might call popular mockery. Popular mockery. Some time ago, I think it must have been about ten years ago, uh, my wife and I attended the Christmas pageant in the local school. And all the children were doing little skits and plays. Quite a pleasant evening, until, to our horror, a number of children appeared on the stage dressed as devils. Their mothers had made uh, paper horns and tails, and they, they circled round the platform, and they sang a song about hell, where people frizzled and fried. This was children, and the audience laughed uproariously at the humor of the thing. And we sat with our flesh crawling with horror. And we could almost hear the words of Christ, whoever offends one of these little ones, it were better that a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast in the depths of the sea. Hell is a joke. We all know how heaven and hell are themes in advertising, whether it be a candy bar or a perfume or anything else. This very day, as we crossed the border into Tennessee, we stopped at the visitor center with friends. My wife picked up this advertisement for a restaurant. It's in a building which used to be a church. It has now become an eating place. Uh, the brochure begins regarding the food so heavenly. It must be sinful. Our chef uses the freshest ingredients available to produce soul-satisfying cuisine. Just as Eve tempted Adam, we are going to tempt you with today's des dessert creations. Imagine our devilish chocolate ecstasy. And so on. And then it ends. Good cheer and God bless. It's a joke. I'll not pollute your ears with, with further examples. There are many of them. We've no wish, wish to repeat these blasphemies. But people regard hell as a joke. Hellfire preachers are a figure of fun. 
And people who believe in hell are either laughed at or pitied. You know that for yourselves. It's a matter of popular mockery. Secondly, it's a matter of serious unbelief. Serious unbelief. We must not underestimate the degree to which some unbelievers do think seriously. They're dead, yes. They're blind, yes. They hate God, yes. Their thinking is distorted, yes. But they are serious people. They do reflect deeply on important issues. They're wrong. But they do think, and it is a simple fact that to many 20th century people, the idea of hell is morally disgusting. To them, it is a primitive superstition. They are genuinely offended by it. They think of it as a crude boogeyman used by a tyrant church to terrify and manipulate simple, uneducated people. The philosopher Bertrand Russell wrote, I do not myself feel that any person who is profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. It is a doctrine that put cruelty into the world and gave the world generations of torture. And we need to realize that many of the people we live among and work with and meet on a daily basis will despise us for believing in hell. That's true. I say that to you young people as you go out into the intellectual world of the university and the workplace. Face up to the fact that intelligent people whom you meet and work with and know will think your belief in hell contemptible or wicked. We'll see later why they think this way. There is serious unbelief. But then thirdly, as we think of pervasive unbelief, there is most tragically and surprisingly of all what we might call evangelical questioning. And by this I mean those who profess to be born again, those who profess belief in Christ as Savior and in many cases may have belief in Christ as Savior, I do not wish to pass judgment on the, on the spiritual condition of these men. For a long time, the liberals have disbelieved hell. We expect that. But what has happened in our generation is that many leading evangelicals have begun to question, and worse than question, that doctrine which was the unanimous faith of the church for over 1,800 years. And in many leading evangelical centers of influence, you will find now not the orthodox teaching of hell, but the teaching of what is called annihilationism or conditional immortality. The belief that God at some stage will simply allow the wicked to pass into nothingness. And certainly in the United Kingdom, I don't know the position here, that belief is on the verge of becoming the majority belief among evangelicals. Men as eminent as John Stott, a man who has written so wisely and helpfully on many topics, Stott has gone on record as dissenting from the doctrine, the orthodox doctrine of hell. Philip Edgecombe Hughes, once a friend of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the author of a marvelous commentary on Hebrews, has come out very strongly against the doctrine of eternal punishment. Other writers suggest what they call post-mortem evangelism. The idea that somehow after death there will be another chance or a first chance for those who did not hear the gospel during their lifetime. Clark Pinnock has moved to what he calls inclusivism. 
the belief that God will forgive and receive to himself followers of other religions if they have lived up to the light which they have received. A good Buddhist will go to heaven. A good member of Islam will go to heaven if they have been faithful to the light given in their own religion. Evangelical questioning. And it's bad enough that these men seek to abolish hell. But some of them also attack the biblical doctrine with appalling vigor and blasphemy. Let me give you two quotations, one from a British scholar, one from an American. John Wenham, a Greek, a New Testament scholar, at a conference in 1991, a leading evangelical, makes this statement. I believe that endless torment is a hideous and unscriptural doctrine which has been a terrible burden on the mind of the church for many centuries and a blot on her presentation of the gospel. I should indeed be happy if before I die I could help in sweeping it away. Clark Pinnock goes even further. I apologize for for bringing these words before you, but brethren and sisters, we have to realize what is happening. We cannot be naive. Here's what Dr. Pinnock has to say. I consider the concept of hell as endless torment, an outrageous doctrine, a theological and moral enormity. How can Christians possibly project a deity of such cruelty and vindictiveness? Surely a God who would do such a thing is more like Satan than like God. Everlasting torment is intolerable from a moral point of view. It makes God into a bloodthirsty monster who maintains an everlasting Auschwitz for victims whom he does not even allow to die. This is the unbelief. This is the unbelief. This is the questioning. And in the face of such questioning, it would be easy for the Lord's people to be swept away. To say, well, these are clever men. These are great scholars. These are eminent leaders of the church. And it is such an unpleasant doctrine. Is it not possible that they are right? Is it not possible that new light has come and that we should follow their example? And even where evangelicals hold to the doctrine, they often hold to it timidly, half-heartedly, hesitatingly. One writer speaks of a man who was preaching and he warns his hearers, those who do not turn to Christ will suffer grave eschatological ramifications. What a roundabout way of trying to say something which the Bible makes plain. Evangelicals are silent about hell. In a recent volume of Evangelical Theology, the volume itself is 800 pages long. Eight lines are devoted to the doctrine of hell. Is that the balance of the Scriptures? Why should we think about hell? Because it is a very important doctrine. Because it is under savage and sustained attack from the world outside and from inside the professing church. Because here is where the battle is raging. Perhaps you remember Martin Luther's definition of a good soldier. It was something like this. He said, you may be as brave as you like at every other point of the field. But if you run away where battle is joined, you are no soldier at all. It's easy to be a soldier where there's no battle. It's easy to parade up and down in your uniform and wave your shiny weapons and make great speeches. But in the blood and guts and wounds and sweat and danger of the fight, That's where the soldier is proved. 
And here is a doctrine where there's a battle. Here's a doctrine which is being attacked by the devil. Here's a doctrine where skillful, otherwise orthodox, eloquent, persuasive, and gifted men are seeking to overthrow the truth of the word of God. And friends, that's reason enough for us to think about it. It's possible, you know, for doctrines to be lost, lost for centuries. It's happened in history in the past. The gospel itself has been submerged. It has been distorted. It has, been, it has gone underground. And for hundreds of years, generations have perished because Christians didn't hold on to the truth and fight for the truth. Do you want your grandchildren to, to grow up in a world where hell is never preached and never taught and no one believes in it and it is looked upon as a superstition of a past age? No. We've got to keep this doctrine alive. We've got to, to know what we believe and why we believe it and be sure and firm and clear that we may do battle for it. Why should we think about hell? Because of its intrinsic importance and because of pervasive unbelief of the doctrine. Both of these are valid reasons for study. But there is a third and last reason which is infinitely, infinitely more significant than either of these. And it is this we should think about the doctrine of hell because unbelief is a symptom of a deeper problem. Unbelief is a symptom of a deeper problem. That's what a symptom is. A symptom has an importance far beyond itself. One day you find a lump on your body. The lump itself is no problem. It is not painful. It doesn't discommode you in any way. It doesn't prevent you from living as normal and doing your work. The, the lump in and of itself is insignificant. Yet do you say that? Of course not if you have any sense or any care for your body. You go to your doctor. You ask for an examination. You seek treatment. It's not because of the lump. It's because of what it might signify, what it might be a sign of, a deeper malady, something more deadly and dangerous than, than the very symptom itself. Now that's not a perfect illustration because uh, disbelief in hell is far, far more than a symptom. But it's true to this extent that it is a symptom of something even worse. Unbelief in hell is a symptom of man's deepest problem, man's most wicked sin. And that is man-centeredness. Man-centeredness. The sin which puts us at the center of our universe, at the focus of interest. We become the people round whom all else revolves. It goes back to, to Eden, where Satan said to Adam and Eve, you will be like God. It goes back further. Satan himself had said that. I will be like God. The sin of putting yourself, instead of God, in the center of your world. And what I want to say, friends, is that this sin of self-centeredness, of humanism, for that's another name for it. Although it has always been present in the world, has at the end of the 20th century completely overwhelmed and saturated and dominated our culture so that it masters the whole world in which you and I live. Man-centeredness is as pervasive as the air we breathe. And it is as unnoticed as the air we breathe. And there's no one in this building who is unaffected by it. We can't escape it. It's like pollution 
in the atmosphere. It's there. We take it in. We absorb it. We breathe it in. We are poisoned by it. What I want to say to you is this, that it is this man-centeredness which is at the root of the objections to hell, and especially the evangelical objections. These objections are not due to new exegetical discoveries. They are because men have imbibed the spirit of the world. I don't know the particular stance of the American writer David F. Wells, but he has certainly written some very, very perceptive material. Here's his comment on hell. These truths today have become awkward and disconcerting to hold. Now get this. Not because of new light from the Bible, but because of new darkness from the culture. That is exactly true. Now that's not what we're told in the evangelical books. The evangelicals say, now we've greater understanding now. We've gone into the meaning of these words. We've studied the background. We've greater knowledge than our forefathers. And as a result of our exegetic exegetical skill and insight, we are now able to correct what they believed. And it is our exegesis which has led us to question the doctrine of hell. No, it is not their exegesis which has led them to question the doctrine of hell. They have been affected by the world and by the spirit of the world. And then they have prostituted their exegetical skills to construct a conclusion that they have already chosen and decided upon. It's exactly the same with the issue of feminism. We have this whole movement today and we're told of these great new insights and the great research into Greek vocabulary and understanding and how we have to transform what we previously believed. That's rubbish. Rubbish. That is intellectual dishonesty of the worst kind. Their minds were made up in advance. And then they're clever enough to construct a rationale for what they have arrived at irrationally. And naive people read and say, oh, look at the scholarship, look at the, look at the cleverness. No, no. It's not new light from the Bible. It's new darkness from the culture. Let me in closing give three examples of how this spirit is manifested. It's shown firstly in a man-centered view of man. A man-centered view of man. I mean by that that the highest imaginable good in our society is human well-being and human happiness. That is the key. That is the ultimate. That is the purpose of all activity, the reason for all life, the foundation on which our whole civilization is built. People must be happy. People must be happy. And the doctrine of hell comes like a great, brutal, violent fist and smashes its way through the fabric of that humanistic worldview. It rips it to shreds. It shakes the foundation to the core. And it tells us that millions of human beings will be unspeakably wretched in a place of torment forever. And friends, that just blows people's minds. That just blows all the fuses. They, they just they cannot take that in. That is completely unacceptable. It calls into question everything modern man lives for and modern man stands for. People must be happy. Man's well-being is the goal. And the doctrine of hell speaks of the millions of the damned. They, they just can't accept it. It's not rational. It's emotional. And even Christians can be affected. How often have we heard the question or asked the question, how could we be happy in heaven? 
knowing that other human beings are in hell. Now, I want to treat that question tenderly because I know that for many of you it's an agonizing question. It's a personal question. I'm not making fun of it. And we look at it a later evening. But I would just say, my friend, just reflect for a moment. When you're in heaven and see the glory of God and the Lamb who was slain and your minds and your hearts are filled with God himself, I can assure you, you will not be unhappy. And if you were to say, yes, but it wouldn't be enough to see God, it wouldn't be enough to be with Christ. It wouldn't be enough to be glorified if I knew that some human beings were in hell. Is that not man-centeredness? Is that not the influence of the world creeping in and, and affecting us? It's natural. But it's still there. It's interesting that people have no problem with heaven. Heaven agrees with their worldview, at least their degraded, distorted concept of heaven, a place where everyone is happy. Oh, that's fine. But hell, it contradicts, it, it, it shatters the man-centered view of man. And then secondly, it opposes the man-centered view of sin. The man-centered view of sin. What is sin in the modern world? Sin is what hurts other people, isn't it? They don't call it sin, of course. And they're very selective. They don't mind hurting unborn children who are inconvenient. They don't mind driving scissors into the back of their necks and sucking out their brains and crushing their skulls and dragging them from their mother's womb. And mark my words, they won't mind hurting the disabled. And they won't mind putting the elderly to sleep when they become too expensive to care for. We're heading for a world of horror if God does not move in revival. It's very selective. It's very dishonest. But yet, there's a generally held view among decent, civilized people that you shouldn't hurt other people. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't kill. You shouldn't do violence, you shouldn't exploit, you shouldn't tell lies. And many of our fellow men are, are ashamed of these things. And they try not to do them. And they think the world would be a better place if, if these things didn't exist. And they're troubled in their conscience about these things. Because they hurt other people. But they have absolutely no sense of sin as against God. You could talk to them about the sixth, the seventh, the eighth commandment, and they would see some reason in that. Well, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't steal. But try talking to them about the second, third, and fourth commandments. You shouldn't make graven images or worship God in any other way than that is appointed in his word. You shouldn't take God's name in vain. You should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They think you're mad. Does the average person have any sense of guilt about the way he or she spends the Lord's day? I don't think so. I don't think it ever crosses their mind that they're doing anything wrong. And if you were to go next door to them and say, do you know that you're sinning? You're out there cutting your grass, you're going out to the theater. That's a very wrong thing to do. They would look at you and say, what sort of religious freak are you? And what would, their, what would their question be? What harm does it do? Who am I hurting? No one. We even hear the clamor for what is called safe sex. It doesn't matter how perverted it is. It doesn't matter how unnatural. It doesn't matter how irresponsible. It doesn't matter how unclean as long as it's safe. Of course, that's a lie. It's anything but safe. But the rationale is there. So for modern man, sin isn't a big deal. It's hurting people. And you shouldn't hurt people. But if you hurt them, well, you can pay them, you can apologize, you can get therapy, you can do something about it. And there's our heredity, our environment, our genes. We can't help these things. 
We shouldn't hurt people. But it's not a big deal. And hell comes. And hell smashes this facade to pieces. And hell says there is a great, awesome, holy, almighty being in whose eyes you are dreadfully guilty. Hell comes to a man who has committed murder and adultery. And the Spirit of God leads him to say, O God, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And this doctrine tells human beings that sin is so fearfully serious, so damnable in God's eyes, that it must be punished by an eternity of suffering. And it lifts human wrongdoing onto an entirely different plane and sets it in the context of accountability and judgment and everlasting consequences. That's why people don't want anything to do with it. Because it tells them that sin is far, far more serious and awful than they would ever want to admit. It merits damnation. A man-centered view of man. A man-centered view of sin. And lastly, hell contradicts a man-centered view of God. And that's worst of all. Have you noticed how for several generations our culture has systematically destroyed in our young people any sense of respect or awe or admiration We have no heroes anymore. It's interesting to to examine biographies written 50 years ago and biographies written today. 50 years ago they would tell you about some great man, his achievements, his ambitions, his virtues. And you read the biography and you were stirred and you were stimulated. And you thought to yourself, well, I'm sure they've covered over some weaknesses. He wasn't perfect. But, but the, the, the effect was ennobling and uplifting. But what does a biographer do now? If you were writing a biography and you wanted to sell, what would you do? You'd ferret out all the dirty little secrets, wouldn't you? All the inconsistencies, all the scandals. And you would publish those. And you would say in your book, he's no better than us. He's no different from us. There are no heroes. There are no noble people. They're all liars. They're all on the take. And that's because they hit the hero. The supreme being. That's because they want to level everyone down. That's because they fear the thought of goodness and holiness which stands in judgment over them. Behind it all is a hatred of God. And the God people uh, speak about today is a God who, if he exists at all, is for man's benefit. Man's benefit. God's purpose is to supply our needs, to provide for our happiness, to meet our desires. God is a heavenly bellboy. And whenever you need him, you press the button. And whenever you don't need him, you tell him to go away. You have no interest in him. The first answer of the shorter catechism has been rewritten. God's chief end is to satisfy man and to provide for him forever. Isn't that the view of God? Even in evangelical churches, to make us happy, to solve our problems, to meet our needs, to answer our prayers, to heal our sicknesses, to give us good marriages, to give our children good jobs, to make us happy. That's what God is for. Martin Luther described it as using God. Using God. What a disgusting phrase. What did you think of a man who spoke of using his wife? What a wretch he would be. Have you ever been used? Somebody you thought was your friend. You thought they loved you. They thought you thought they liked your companionship, your fellowship. They they thought you thought you could trust them and depend on them. And then you find out they were using you. They never loved you. 
They laughed at you behind their back, your back. They took what they could get and they sneered at you. That's what people are doing with God. That's how they think they can treat the God of heaven and earth. No holiness, no majesty, no awesomeness. He's a little puppet who stays on a box until we press the switch to let him out. But friends, the doctrine of hell confronts us with a God who is far, far different. A God who is overwhelming in his anger, terrifying in his power, awesome in his justice, a mighty sovereign who holds the whole earth in his hand like a pinch of dust, high as the heavens above the earth. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand. Or say to him, what have you done? Hell speaks to us of of a God who is terrifying. A God who is sovereign. A God who is uncontrollable. A God who takes us and does with us as he pleases. A God whom we can't manipulate or ignore or marginalize or use. Who wants a God like that? People today don't want him. And they will banish any doctrine which brings him frighteningly before us. And that is why it is so vital that we think seriously about hell. Because it brings us every one face to face with the living God. And it is a litmus test for our souls. Am I God-centered? Or am I man-centered? Hell will test you. Hell will test you. And I believe there will be no belief in hell until there is a recovery of a belief in God. And I believe, although I won't take time to expand on it now, that that is why our Reformed churches are so, so vital. Who will tell of the great God? Who will tell of the great God? People must hear until they hear of this God. They'll not believe in hell. I don't think you could teach the doctrine as an isolated thing on its own. You have to see God. You have to understand God. His holiness. His majesty. His power. His infinity. Hell doesn't make sense until you see God. You can't grasp it. You can't get hold of it. But once you see God, once you're confronted by God, the living God, the true God, once you and I gaze into the face of that holy, majestic, powerful being, then we are ready to understand, to believe all that God says. When the day of judgment comes, no one will be laughing. No one will be producing little flippant brochures about heaven and hell. No one will be questioning the morality of eternal punishment. No broad-minded preachers will be saying, I don't believe a God of love could send anyone to hell. We'll all be in our faces. We'll all be in our faces. We'll be overwhelmed before the majesty, the intense reality of the living and true God. And that's why this week I've decided not to spend time refuting the errors of these men. I hope you're not disappointed by that. At first I was going to. And then I thought, why should we let these men set our agenda? Why should we spend time answering their silly little objections when we know that that's not the real problem? The real problem is they haven't seen God. They don't know God. Why should we think about hell? Because it brings us face to face with the overwhelming reality of God. God. That's our greatest need. That's why the devil has attacked this doctrine so persistently. Some of you here tonight are unconverted. You need To meet God. We're not playing games here. 
We're not spinning words. You need to face up to the reality of the God who made you. The God who gives you breath as you sit here. The God against whom you have sinned. The God to whom you are accountable. The God who will judge you. The God who will condemn you, certainly, if you do not cry for mercy to his Son. Some of us, as believers, have been influenced by the world. Become man-centered. The vision of God has become dim. And our view of Christianity is becoming a little bit selfish. We've come to this conference thinking, what's in it for me? What will I enjoy? What practical lessons will I learn? There's nothing wrong with that. But more than anything else, we need as believers, again, to meet our God. In His glory and in His majesty. May He use this doctrine to bring it before us. Some of you dear saints have a sorrow deeper than tears for loved ones who are now gone from this earth with as far as you know no interest in Christ. And they were bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, and you loved them. And you were right to love them. And the thought that they are now lost, that they are now damned, is unbearably painful to you. I cannot comfort you. But I can bring you to God by His grace and strength. And I know that if you will come into His presence with your tears and your questions and your anguish, then He'll put His Father's arms around you. And he'll hold you. And he'll comfort you. You may not have the answers. But you'll feel around you. The God of love. Who does all things well. Whose ways are all righteousness and truth. Who cannot hurt any of his children. But who is to be praised and honored. In all that he does. And you will be comforted. Remember the words of the. Redeemed in heaven, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for your judgments have been manifested. That's the only answer to our hearts. To see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we are terribly afraid of this truth. It scares us. It overwhelms us. To my own ears, my voice has been like the babbling of a little child on the surface of things. But it is your truth. Hell is your hell. And you are our God. And you are righteous and holy and perfect. We do not need to fear your truth if we are in Christ. Lord, we pray for any here still in their sins. Great God, touch them by your Spirit and do in them what none of us can do. Enable them to see the pit of hell over which they now stand. And there is nothing holding them up but the hand of a God who is angry with them. 
Lord, lead them to flee from the wrath to come. Help us, we pray, in this study and in all our meditation on your word throughout this week, that you alone may be glorified through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.